Good morning. Everybody's fine? I hope you have enjoyed the City Beach Club at the Landungsbrücken yesterday. And I'm happy that we now start with the conference after one year and year of work. We will open this conference with a thrilling opening, key opening keynote. And you will be warned, this is not a nerd talk. <laughs> I have the pleasure to introduce Angela Sasse. Angela is the head of information security research at the University College of London. And she has another title as director of the Research Institute for Science of Cybersecurity. Um, it's quite interesting that Angela has not a classical computer security background. She comes from the usability studies. And the first paper I saw from her has a very nice title, Users are not the enemy. And this may be a lecture we can learn from. When we look in our Overst wiki, we see tons of technical information about cross-site scripting, about uh, XSS, uh, <laughs> about SSL, CSP, and other things. But in fact, we do not try to protect bits and bytes and servers and databases. We try to protect information, which belongs to users, business processes. But we do not talk about the users. Sometimes we try to instruct them you have to follow the following guidelines. And um, we can see this with passwords or encryption, and in practice, this doesn't work very well. Here we can learn why and what we can do better. Angela, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Boris. Uh, good morning. So, uh, as far as the title of the talk is concerned, um, where, where does it come from? Well, um, that's um, from a textbook, which uh, ma many of you may know, which is about, was published in the same year as, uh, as my paper, Users Are Not um, the Enemy, was published. And it's basically in the introduction to um, the Java book, where Gary McGraw and Ed Felton basically said, given a choice between dancing pigs and security, users will pick dancing pigs every time. Um, and there's basically several ways how you can, um, how you can read that statement. Um, I think a more differentiated view is, um, is, is actually the one that Bruce Schneier, who then quoted this, you know, if you go back through his blogs and various publications, he quoted this dancing pigs thing um, several times. So, but he said, if J random web surfer clicks on a button that promises dancing pigs on his computer monitor and instead gets an oratory message describing the potential dangers of the app layers, he's going to choose the dancing pigs over computer security any day. Um, so, um, he says, the applet, um, if you get a warning screen like the applet dancing pigs should contain, could contain malicious code that might do permanent damage to your computer, steal your life savings, and repair your ability to have children, he'll click OK without even reading it. 30 seconds later, he won't even remember uh, that the warning was, was there. Um, so I hate to I hate to pick a fight with Bruce, but um, occasionally one has to, particularly <laughs> if, you, um, if you if you work on the user side, because um, he's um, you know Bruce has over particularly over the past five years since he and Ross Anderson started an annual conference called Security and Human Behavior. Um, he's become increasingly um, interested in the human behavior side and, you know, to what extent it is actually predictable and to what extent it could be guided towards more secure behavior. So, um, Bruce said he'll click OK without even reading it. How many of you think that's true? OK, interesting. Um, thoughts? Uh, because one of the things we do in usability labs is eye tracking studies. You know, we basically look at how, when, when, when people interact with the system, where they look on the screen and how they look it. And I can tell you if there's a warning that pops up, um, that becomes a hotspot. Almost every user looks at it and they will actually read it. You know, we can basically literally follow the eye movements along the text. So read it, they do. 
30 seconds later, he won't even remember that the warning even existed. How many of you think that's true? Okay, that actually is true. <laughs> if you would, were, were to ask them um, about it later on, and I mean, we, we do these kind of tests, like we show them some other warnings afterwards and say, was it this one? Was it that one? Um, and, you know, and, and basically inevitably user will users will tell you that if, oh, if I'd seen this other warning, I would have paid attention and I would have done the secure thing. <laughs> yeah. um, no, they definitely can't remember. But we have to ask ourselves the questions, you know, rather than just painting, um, you know, this, uh, what I think is just so counterproductive, what we often see is just to paint the problem as it's stupid users. And that's not changed. You know, when I first got into this field, when I was asked by a company to look at why these stupid users couldn't remember their passwords um, in the mid-90s and since that paper, I mean, this is basically uh, is something that's still not changed. This is idea of, you know, that only if the users weren't so stupid, we wouldn't have so much of a problem. Um, but um, I hopefully want to um, convince you this morning that there is actually something that designers could do to make it easier for users to do the right thing, and that actually the responsibility lies on the design side and not so much on trying to reconfigure humans and turning them into something that they're not. <laughs> you know, um, it is wetware and it comes with its limitations um, and, and, and faults, and you have to design for that. Um, you can't basically um, think you, know, you can turn everybody into a security expert. So um, I want to quickly run through um, the, my, my top 10. And like the OS top 10, I would say it's a work in progress. Um, this is actually my first attempt <laughs> at, <laughs> at, giving, um, at giving this particular talk. And I'm sure if I gave it in a year's time, the top 10 will look slightly different. But I think the top five are actually pretty, um, you know, they, they, they just don't change at all because they're connected to the limitations um, that, we're, that we're dealing with when we're designing in this space. So, um, so the first one is, is at the moment, you know, um, the situation is, and, and we do lots of interviews with uh, people, with basically ordinary sort of web users, mobile users, but the, the bulk of my work is in the corporate area where basically we go in and help companies improve their own um, employees' security behavior. And these, you know, they're serious, you know, there's sort of serious stuff at risk in most of those companies. And even, even but even there, when it comes to, to a particular warning and something that, that users encounter, if you speak to them about it, they genu generally just don't believe the warnings anymore. And my argument would be, is it's our own fault that they don't. Um, because there are loads of warnings, and they're getting more every day. But there are, actually, when you look in reality, very few consequences. And so what happens is then we're trying, you know, we're sort of like we're basically getting into this like downward spiral again. So if we look at um, SSL warnings, for instance, certificate warnings, we've made the language scarier. We've made users do, make, do more clicks in order to get away from that particular warning. Um, and, um, but still, you know, when they do, rarely are there any consequences. And that basically is, is just, you know, sort of a, a, a reinforcement loop. Um, there may be consequences, but the vast majority of consequences are not immediately visible to the user. Um, if you, if you talk to them about what they, they think, if they really downloaded something, you know, say you get a PDF warning, they think if that file was really malicious, you know, nice PDFs that I use every day, you know, I couldn't get my work done without PDFs, you know, my professors say I have to read these papers, you know, it's what the students will tell you. You know, my professors publish papers that are PDFs that are on the web, how can these be bad? So you say to them, so what do you think would happen if, if this, this file really was malicious. Well, essentially, they tell you they effectively think the computer would blow up right in front of them. Right? <laughs> that, that is what, um, you know, if, if, if there really was something bad, you know, I would notice, you know, it would, um, it would tell me. Um, the other reason you often hear is that they say, like, but I've got all this security stuff on my computer already, right? Virus scanners, you know, something. Surely they'll take care of that, right? 
And it's not until in one of the experiments we did, you then actually sit them down and you, you basically say, like, you know, we, we often make people bring their own laptops um, to, to the kind of studies we do. If you then say, like, would you like to sit down with a security expert and would you like us to go through your computer and see whether there are actually things on there? If you walk through and then show them all the stuff that's there and you explain to them what, you know, what that is and what it does, you know, then suddenly they go, like, oh, <laughs> you know, okay, you maybe, you know, and, and that can be like downright malicious things like spyware, you know, which of course really scares them, or it could be stuff that's, that's marked as benign by some quarters, you know, such as tracking software, you know. Most users, you have to basically imagine, remember that most users don't understand cross-site tracking, for instance. They don't, they, they just don't believe, you know, that, that they're being followed from one website to another. The vast majority of users don't understand that. So, if you really um, want warnings to be effective, you know, you'd have to be, that have to be visible consequences. You'd have to actually show them that something happens as a result. Um, if you don't, basically what happens is you get a reinforcement loop. Um, I was in a hurry, I ignored this warning, um, I just went ahead anyway nothing bad happened. So what do you think that person is going to do next time when they encounter a warning? You know? And so, and the more often you do that, and the more often you get away with it, um, it's, um, so this comes down to a fundamental usability principle. Warnings, you know, pop-up boxes that uh, give you warnings are supposed to be for genuine exceptions that the designer couldn't really plan for. Um, using them, as a routine security measure, um, it's just not working. So, they don't believe you, even if they did believe you, number two, I'd say they'd still ignore you most of the time. And why is that? It's because their, their goal and their attention is elsewhere, you know? Nobody um, starts, gets a computer or downloads apps on their phone because they want to do security. <laughs> Right? They do it because they're trying to, to get their shopping done, you know, sort of like try and find out what the crime rate in their area is, whatever, you know, um, play with dancing pigs, what, you know, watch some dancing pigs um, for, for, for some light relief or entertainment. That's what they want to do. And actually, in a lot of these transactions, um, people, act, it's not they're entirely unaware that there is a risk. But that is, you know, there is risk involved in crossing the road, and people learn in day-to-day -day life to manage risks in some way or other that's, that's compatible with their um, risk propensity, their stance, what, you know, what, what they basically uh, find acceptable or not. Um, and they weigh that against benefits, right? And so, actually, later on, when I show you the, the sort of key vulnerabilities that users have, is what attackers understand very well is that you can hide risks and you can devalue risks hugely um, if the user expects significant benefits, right? And if there are significant benefits, that then basically the, 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 the understanding of the risk doesn't really quite get through. So... Um, it's also, as Cormac Hurley pointed out in his 2009 paper, um, all users see is a lot of cost of security that's being dumped on them, you know, that, that basically they have to make loads of efforts on, on various security measures. But if something, when something goes wrong, the vast majority of users, of course, don't bear the cost of that. You know, the service providers, most of the time, absorb the cost because they realize that if uh, lots of users really got, um, you know, got landed with the consequences, they'd very soon stop using the services um, that they're being offered if there really was that genuine risk attached to them. So um, the third reason is, is when you basically give them, give them a warning like that, is actually very often you don't give them a real choice. So the... <laughs> Um, the warning, you know, most of the warnings actually just say danger, danger, you know, and they use a particularly scary jargon, um, but they don't really tell you, so if I actually wanted to do this, but I wanted to do it in a secure way, what do I actually have to do? Uh, uh, and, you know, sort of for, for, for most of them, you know, the, the consequence would, you know, the only thing they could do is, is, is just abandon the whole thing and walk away. But that's not really an option for most people who need to get, get on with things. So an interesting development, um, at Microsoft they have given um, 
basically they've got this acronym called NEAT, which some of you may have seen, where they say to, to designers, and they basically hand out little whiskey glasses with NEAT engraved on them, if you get the, the, the pun. Um, and they basically have like, like a card like this, which says, um, you know, which is supposed to keep next to your desk while programming. Um, and um, you basically, before you put a warning in, you should ask yourself whether it's, it's necessary. Um, are you explaining what's going on? Is it actionable, i.e., are you telling the user what they should do? what they can do in order to do this securely? And have you tested it? Have you um, basically asked the usability people for help to put this in front of a bunch of users and see if, um, if they actually understand what to do and if they do the right thing? And then basically, they, of course, they can't resist it. This was a nice, compact <laughs> instructions. Then but it comes with spruce where they then effectively like go and spoil it all by saying you should basically um, state the source of, of it, what the process is, you know, the actionable steps, explain what the risk is, um, you know, then basically what tap into the unique, um, you know, sort of unique knowledge. And, well, frankly, if you're dealing with users, you would know by this point, you know, you've lost them. Um, they've basically, you've lost their attention completely and they've moved on to something else. Uh, which probably explains why, even though this has been, um, has basically has been um, around at Microsoft for about three years now, I still don't think <laughs> the warnings we're getting there um, have got significantly fewer or have been significantly improved. Um, right, so number four is um, you're asking them to do something that is humanly impossible. Um, and my number one villain I want to hold up here is the capture. Um, so, the CAPTCHAs have a failure rate of, of about 50% um, when it comes to the first attempt, and even after three attempts, there is, is about a 40% failure rate, right? So, um, basically, like, I mean, I won't fly, it's a mystery to me how anybody flies an airline that <laughs> makes them do a CAPTCHA before you can even find out where they fly to. Um, <laughs> you know, never mind when and how much it's going to cost before you add on the baggage and the printing of the boarding pass and yada, yada, yada. Um, but this is really, um, you know, what I think is, is the worst example of anti-usability. Um, you, you're solving a security problem that, you know, as a service provider, you've got problems with attackers who are trying to do certain nasty things like, you know, get accounts or as far as Ryanair is concerned, the attackers are websites that are trying to screen scrape um, their prices and feed them into their price comparison websites. So you make all legitimate users do extra work to prove that they are human, um, doing something, you know, that any freely downloadable program, <laughs> you know, the whole number of, of freely downloadable programs are a lot better at than the average user. Um, that's just bizarre, you know, and I think these they should be banned. Um, I'm, I'm not the only person, so David Pogue, from, who writes for the Scientific American, calculated that every day we spend 17 man years um, on, uh, of effort in the Western world dealing with captures. That's just bizarre. And if you go out there and look, there are hate websites that people have set up, you know, posting the worst captures they've come across and venting you know, about how insane this is. Um, they're not particularly secure either because um, most service providers in the Western world have to apply by accessibility guidelines, which means that um, for users who, who have... Um, difficulty, you know, sort of have, have, have limited sight um, or color blindness or something like that, you have to provide an alternative way of accessing the web page. And most of those are put up, you know, as, as a quick, like, oh, let's just ask him to add, ask him to add up two and two, and whatever, and they're ridiculously easy to attack. Um, and that's, of course, then where the attacker goes, whilst, meanwhile, the genuine users sit there, you know, and try and, like, figure out these squiggly letters. Um, number five is you're asking them to do something that might be possible if they only had to do it once or twice a day. But if they have to do it over and over again, it just starts to add up to a burden that um, people won't comply with. So um, in, in, in my area, we talk about the great authentication fatigue, right? So users are actually just absolutely fed up 
with, with passwords and having to re-enter and retype passwords. So there is undoubtedly has been a big market for password management programs. Um, but if you, of course, speak to security, you know, sort of, so people use things like LastPass and whatever. Um, but they are not particularly secure. Um, and the other problem is, is if for some reason that program doesn't work, well, you can be damn sure the users can't remember what that password was that the password manager had created for them or that they had stored. You know, so you get large-scale lockouts, and I'll come to, come to that in a minute. Um, we really, really have to, to do something else. In, the, in a study we, we did with the US um, National Institutes of Standards and Technology, you know, when you actually look at you know, sort of the way that people describe it, it's the disruptiveness of, of it, you know, sort of, so people basically go like, I've been sitting here for two hours, right, and I'm using two computers because I'm reading something on one, I'm programming something on the other, but every 15 minutes, if I haven't touched the keyboard on either of them, the screen bank kicks in and I have to prove again that I'm here, right? So people basically do um, get, you know, they find that kind of disruption of their thought stream. It's not just the time that you spend on entering it and trying to remember it. It's the disruption of the, the main thing that you're there for that is really, um, you know, it's, it's really disruptive. And the, the productivity losses are huge. You know, when I and my corporate work go to organizations, I basically, in most of the companies I deal with, people spend about three weeks a year, the ordinary employee spends three weeks a year just logging in to various systems, services, and kind of things. I mean, that's a huge productivity loss, you know. Um, but that is what we are, what we are basically have by, by just basically everybody forces their own authentication on it. Um, and even in companies that have moved to single sign-ons and have tried to make it easy for, you as, as, for, for their employees, as soon as you use a third-party software, um, a third-party service, like say in the city it would be Bloomberg and Reuters, they all insist on having their own authentication because they want to keep track of the licenses. And you get a few of those and hey presto, they already have 10 other passwords, 10 passwords they have to enter during the day. Um, so the, the workarounds, when, when, when we go and do these audits, the workarounds are everywhere. They're endemic. You know, the kind of the, the people who use the multiple computers and are fed up with the screen locks just install mouse jigglers. Um, you know, to keep the screens open. And of course, when they then get up and walk away from the computer, they forget that they've done it. And then the machine is unattended and open, and then you've got a real security risk. Um, the widespread password reuse is, you know, um, is, is basically people recycle and reuse passwords across multiple sites. So if the password is captured in one place, um, you can get into other accounts. And this is just so common that people forget that they do it. And we've had several incidents like this where really, you know, access to really sensitive machines and um, uh, servers has been captured on photo or video and broadcast or printed and sent out. In this case, it was a, it was a rail company in the UK and they wanted happy employees at work for their annual report. And the photographer comes in and said, can I photograph you? And they say, yes, sure. And then the brochure gets printed and sent to thousands of people and it's got the network server passwords on the whiteboard. Um, <laughs> you know, that is, and, and I've, got, I've, got, I've got a dozen examples like that. You know, police stations where they, they film a fly on the wall documentary for Sky or whatever, you know, and then you know it says on on the whiteboard at the back the password is custody underlined three times. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that is, and when people are not aware of that, that becomes a real problem. Number six is all the externalities. So we've got a problem with passwords. What do we do? We just create more work for users. I just want to sort of quickly run through this. You know, sort of now you don't just have to remember the password, you have to remember questions, you know, that you registered X years ago about this pet, well, which I don't have, like 40% of the application. So I have to make up a pet and the name, and then three years later remember what that mythical pet was that I made up and what I called it. Um, Two-factor authentication, yes, very secure, but if, if I don't have cell phone reception, I now can't get into my Gmail account. Thanks, Google. Um, 
if um, Facebook tells me I, um, if I lock myself out, I need to get my friends to tell them that it's really me and so that I reset my account. Well, my friends were going to be really happy if I ring them up in the middle of the night and say, oh, you know, remember that code I gave you like you know, <laughs> nine months ago or so? Could you just try and find that and log in and go to that URL? And then you need to basically authenticate yourself and then type in that code I gave. Yeah, really. Um, so one of the ways, of course, is uh, that that people are trying to that that service providers are trying to deal with the um, authentication crisis in a way is federated identity, and in principle, the idea that you just create you know a, a small number of masters accounts and then use them more widely would be yeah maybe quite quite nice. And the U.S. and U.K. government have said that's what we are going to do. Um, for transactions between citizens and government, we don't want to be an identity provider, we want to use commercial authentication services. Um, but there's massive usability problems. I'm just going like, you know, you've been telling people that redirects and pop-ups are suspicious and <laughs> that they shouldn't do this, you know. You can't do federated identity without a redirect. Um, there's also, it's very clear, part of the risk is that people just forget to log, they log themselves into various sites using the federated identity provider and then forget to log out and then get up and walk away from the machine and, you know, leave themselves in, logged into all this stuff. Also, there's, there's massive trust issues. Most of the users don't understand, you know, and, and who can blame them, the underlying um, commercial model. You know, why would my bank agree to authenticate me to the government or my cell phone provider? What's in it for them unless they can spy on what I'm doing with the government and then use that to market to me? You know, that, that explanation basically isn't there. And privacy protection mechanisms you put in front of them um, like this one, you know, the UK government, from, this is from a test case, the UK government did, where they said, you log in, you know, you have an account with the post office and you log in, um, and then they say happily, did you know, in order to protect your privacy, we do not know who the transaction provider is. And, you know, which basically the users go, what? You know, <laughs> you're giving my data to somebody, you know, and you don't even know who they are. How can that be secure? <laughs> Um, well, yes, it can be, and they thought very carefully about it, but they're just not, you know, not communicating it. But meanwhile, half a do we've got the bizarre situation, half a billion users out there, which is half of all Facebook users, trust the 600-pound gorilla in the room, which is Facebook Connect. Um, which also, and some of them, maybe they trust it, or maybe they just go along with it, because now quite a lot of services won't even give you the option to register an account. It's Facebook Connect, or you don't get to use the service. Um, and that's really sort of like, you know, um, who are we entrusting this to? And as for like, oh, and we don't know who we connect you to, and we don't know what you're doing when you're on this other side. Um, of course, with Facebook Connect, you know, that is exactly what's happening. Um, so, uh, number eight is they think they are better who to trust. So, people's trust models are still re very much sort of stuck in the, um, in, the real, um, in, in the real world, where it's all about, like, you know, what you can see. And if you've dealt with somebody before and they've behaved properly, you expect that next time around they will do the same thing again. And so we really rely very much on, 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 on familiarity. And this is like, you know, people don't sit there and, and sort of spend, you know, spend minutes <laughs> assessing particular threats or what they see on the website, ooh, and, and, and follow up the various links and trust seals and go like, you know, oh, yes, okay, so here's the address for this, the company gives me an address, so let's go and look up in the company's register, in the national company's register, whether the company is really there and whether they're really registered at this address. Nobody does that. The whole point of trust is it's a split-second decision. Um, that allows you to, to get on with things, you know, so sort of people basically really look at a website and they decide whether to go ahead with it or not. Um, and if something is fishy, then, yeah, you know, they probably walk away and go somewhere else, particularly if there is an alternative. But if not, you know, they, um, they expect it to work. And the problem is that people still rely on trust signals from, from, the, from the real world. They think if somebody looks feels, 
smells the same as um, you know, website they've interacted with before, and it worked, they will go for it. And I think this is just a cardinal problem, um, that um, it's too easy to impersonate websites or to impersonate an app, you know, as some, you know, and the user can't tell the difference. So social feedback, real-time social feedback in particular, like reputation mechanisms, are in principle a good idea, and they work to some extent, but not for, uh, for real-time attacks. Number nine is they trust security architectures they shouldn't. Um, so when you get lots of scary messages about non-threats, you know, actually they've only, you know, they, they, their SSL certificates or their revocation lists have expired, um, that actually masks some, some potential real uh, underlying risk. And um, so I'm going to the, um, after the break, to the talk by Henning Pearl up, up in the fry room. And I think the work that um, Matt Smith and his group um, at Hanover University have been doing at actually, you know, how can we really improve the, the underlying security of certificates is, is, is terrific and would be a step in the, in the right direction. If you haven't seen their work, it's, uh, they've, they've run a number of studies which have really um, show that, you know, basically users misplace their trust in um, and, and ascribe a level of protection to the certificates that actually um, isn't, isn't there. And these attacks are really easy and low risk to, ex um, to execute. My final point is like, um, they cling to myths, you know, generally people are trying to make their lives easier and so the belief that certain brands protect them, you know, if I had a dollar every time I heard like, but I'll be fine, I've got an apple. <laughs> you know, I'd, uh, um, I'd be considerably uh, richer now. And what's even happening is there have been several studies that show that the protection that, that people ascribe to apps from the App Store even spreads to Android users. So that basically um, a lot of Android users who download apps thinks the same level of checking has been applied um, as they've heard has been done to, um, you know, has been done, is, is done in the App Store. They also assume that, so, you know, that basically certain protection like virus checkers do all sorts of wonderful things to keep them secure. Um, that in fact they don't, and they think service providers take care of malware. So that's my top 10 list. Um, my conclusions are is you, when you're designing any security solution, you must respect people's time and effort. It is really valuable. Um, if you make it too complex, you're shooting yourself in the foot from a security point of view because um, it, you know, it, it, people won't pay attention, or even if they try and pay attention, they'll probably make a mistake along, um, along the way, way. So you really want minim, minimal disruptiveness and smooth the path to secure behavior. Um, really, we need to integrate security better into applications instead of thinking, you know, we can throw them around at all the different layers in the stack. Um, instead of like having this obstacle security, it's like you're, you know, you're trying to download this now before I even let you download it, you've got to jump this hurdle and then you know, maybe later on when, you, when you've downloaded the app you need to pass other hurdles. Just it should be, um, it, should, it really needs to better in, be it integrated. So one of the things users complain to us often about is, is particularly, they go, okay, so I'm searching. Uh, I'm searching for this product X, right? Then you give me a top 10 websites, and when I click on the seven of them, it gives me a warning saying, this is probably a dangerous website. Why are you showing them to me in the first place if they're dangerous, right? Um, I just like, you know, just show me the safe ones um, and give me an I feel risky button for those days when I, you know, when I actually won't. Uh, when, when I want that, um, and there's sort of there is one company that basically offers this um, uh, the first cybersecurity, where you you get that, and I think it's an example. You know, we can argue about some of the details and to what extent, you know, the, with what the level of reliability is with which they um, mark up. But I think as a as a thought process, that's the right thing. Is you know, integrated into the into the action. Um, I also would want to recommend um, a paper by um, colleagues from Frank Stagiano from Cambridge, who actually pointed out he worked together with a con artist um, 
called Paul Wilson um, and deconstructed all the different types of scams that attackers use. And they say essentially it comes down to seven principles um, that, that the attackers exploit. And um, if you go and download the longer version of their paper from Frank Stagiano's website, um, you'll be able to see um, also some thoughts they've had about how we could um, design architectures better um, to make it harder for attackers to exploit it. So uh, rather than turning users into the enemy, I think we need a pact between designers and users. We need collaboration. So um, in terms of you know, basically minimizing the time and effort, don't simply pass the buck. Um, my target, my motto is we need zero effort, one step to factor authentication. Um, and the technology affords the possibilities, particularly when you think about mobiles, you could give users a simple password and by combining that with the way of how, by detecting how they're entering it on the soft keyboard, you have a, you know, which you can use as a biometric, um, you could have um, fast and low effort solutions. We need more of that kind of thinking. Um, I think usability researchers haven't been particularly good at helping designers either. I think we actually really need to provide more actionable ha -ha, um, advice to security designers in the sense that we should be giving you metrics and measurements um, for security um, measures to actually just show how much effort um, how much effort they take, and we should be profiling the main primary tasks users do in, in web and app interactions and basically give you clear guidance which security measures fit with which primary tasks and which don't. Um, so that's my, my personal research agenda for the future. I think we need better risk communication. This kind of scare, scare, scare um, doesn't work. It needs to be honest, and you need to communicate consequences, not, you know, um, there is a potential, this potential exploit, you know, or that potential malware, um, you need to tell them what it might. Even though if you go to Bruce and say, you know, it'll take all your life savings and, and take away your ability to have children, <laughs> then, um, you know, if he is right, then maybe not. I think maybe security measures that waste users' time should be in the OWASP top 10 because users won't follow them. The ones even who try and follow it will make mistakes, but it will breed the impression that security is just a pain in the neck and not something that users should value and pay attention to. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you, Angela, for the wonderful illustration about the problems with uh, usable security in the real world. Um, and also thank you very much for the suggestion for the next OWASP Top 10. Um, <laughs> in OWASP we always try to do things better and develop best practices. Um, we have a very successful form of the so-called cheat sheet series, which is a very concise list of uh, advice to do things better. Um, maybe we should start a cheat sheet about usable security and begin with yes. some advice you gave us here. Okay, thank you Angela. Thanks. Are there any questions in the uh, audience? Uh, we have no microphones in the audience, so Angela, please can you repeat the question for the recording? I will try. Thank you. That's better. Hi. Uh, Albert Zunkov, Software again. Um, so I have a feeling that um, it's kind of going in a, in a strange way here. Uh, when we, for example, teach children to come out on the streets, uh, they have to understand the dangers. They have to understand where they're going, where, what they have to do, how they have to prepare. They have to look here and there. They have to learn not to trust someone and trust someone else and so on. It takes time. But after a while, uh, children grow and they become adults and they are allowed, after all, to go out onto the street by themselves. And they, we are sure that they can actually handle it. They can handle the complexity of the world outside. They can handle the dangers and risks. And I have a feeling that if we were to protect um, our users or other people, let's say, on the internet the same way, wouldn't that make them permanent children, after all? Would they never grow then? 
Um, no, I think that's, that's a, um, I mean, the, your point about, you know, what we normally do is we teach, um, base, we teach the, the, the risks of dealing with the everyday world through a process called socialization, um, which means, you know, with what your parents teach you and what you learn in school. Um, and I think there is a good argument for that um, is something we, we, we need to consider, you know, when basically children are spending a lot of, um, you know, a lot of their, their life online. We need to consider it. My argument would be is that, um, you know, basically most people wouldn't care um, if, you, if you basically say, you know, you keep... Um, I'm, 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 you know, my security behavior is, is at a level of a child because it's just not important to them. You know, there, there, will be, there may be some areas where they want to be able to take risks and they want to learn more and they want to understand the complexity. But for 90% of things they do, they just want it to be, to be simple and straightforward and, and not disrupt the main things they do. So I think basically just saying, like, oh, you're like a child because you can't be bothered to learn about all these risks and to learn about all the technologies and, you know, download the, very, you know, download the various things. I think it's just you have to accept that people have different, you know, have different priorities in life. And you can't. I mean, basically, I do most of my work is with companies, and the companies call me in, you know, not necessarily because their, um, their employees are just behaving badly. It is because they realize that the security measures they've deployed just cost them a phenomenal amount of money. And there is only, you know, you can only spend, you know, I mean, sort of realistically, about 5% of your time dealing with security. So, yes, people have to learn something, but it's got to be something you can compress <laughs> into 5% or less um, of, 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 of the time that people spend interacting online. If it's more than that, no. We have time for... Uh, we have still time for two more questions. There's one on the right side here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Pete Sampson from Security Innovation. Have you done uh, much work or are you aware of any research that's been done on the effectiveness of general security awareness programs within an organization? Yeah. Um. <laughs> to struggle to find a polite way of characterizing it. I mean, most of the stuff is just, it's is, is really, it's awful. It's absolutely awful, you know, because in nine out of 10 companies, it consists of repeating the policies at people. Um, and I kid you not, I mean, examples I have, um, you know, where, where they have to, on an annual basis, read through all the policies and say they have read and understood them. Um, and there'll be 450 policies and 80 of them contradict each other and, um, you know, or it's not clear how they apply. That is not security awareness and training. Um, what we are doing now is, um, is that we basically say, like, you know, let's just basically, first of all, get your house in order, sort out your policies, be clear about the company has to decide what its priorities are and how it's managing the risk. And then get down to a core set of behaviors where you say to users, you know, sort of things like, you know, you never give out, you know, here are your authentication credentials. You never give them out to anyone, nobody at all, you know, no, who they claim to be, who they are, whatever. Um, you know, and um, sort of a clear, if you've got a clear manageable set of rules like that, and they now have to go into the induction training that people get in the companies, um, if you get down to that simple manageable set and you start, you know, basically have the new people coming in, have the people at the top saying and, and, and demonstrating that they take it seriously and that they comply with the rules, you can start to shift things around. But just repeating policies at people or scaring people, which is what most so-called security awareness is today, I think is counterproductive. One last question, please. Yeah. You talked about having a list of the uh, different types of issues that you've encountered from a UX perspective, but one of the, we have lots of lists of different things that people are doing wrong at OWASP. Um, one of the things we are kind of soft on is providing direct, usable, prescriptive guidance for people about how they can fix some of these issues. Are there any resources from a UX perspective that we can kind of take and use to implement some of these issues? 
Uh, th this is, I think this is something we absolutely need. And what it is, it's, um, I mean, I could show you, I, I thought about giving another talk where I looked at some usable security principles and, and talked through, you know, how, whether designers can actually apply them. And the answer is you cannot apply them unless you give clear implementation scenarios. Um, and you actually really show, you know, who are the different stakeholders here, um, we know what's passed, what is the legal obligation, for instance, you need to discharge in this particular scenario. So, so I think we need scenarios. Um, the Webinars project has been doing, doing some of this work, and I'm, I'm very interested to work with them. And I think ultimately, yes, you know, then you can basically put, um, put this guidance in, but it needs to be in a particular scenario, because there's several often competing demands that, that come together. And I still dream of that it might be possible to have patents eventually that you can apply, which I think would make the designer's job an awful lot easier. Angela, thank you very much. Thank you.